So the spectacular Spider-Man is a thing, and there have been many Spider-Man reboots and redos and reduxes, or however you pronounce that, over the years. So why am I talking about a Spider-Man cartoon that was cancelled ten years ago and doesn't even have any good memes? Eck, my arachnads! Well, for starters, I love Spider-Man. And while he doesn't have the greatest superpowers, and nor is he my favorite superhero by a long shot, Spider-Man has always had something in its storytelling that no other superhero really has. And the spectacular Spider-Man TV show had everything that a story needed to make Spider-Man truly great. Keep in mind that this is all opinion, but the spectacular Spider-Man TV show is the greatest adaptation of Spider-Man ever. The reason I can say that with full confidence isn't just because I like it the most, although that is definitely true, I can say it because this show handles storytelling different from a movie. The way the showrunners handle well-known and established characters, how they reinvigorate and reimagine plot lines and events, and most importantly, how they handle the Peter Parker and Spider-Man dichotomy. Like many other animated shows, it appears that this show is for children, when in fact it really is not. But if I can't dance with Pete, I guess I'll dance with... It's Randy, right? Very. All of this leads to a show that is considered by fans and critics alike to be, well, spectacular. So today, I want to talk about the spectacular Spider-Man. The show, not the comics. Greg Weissman, who had previously worked on the animated series Gargoyles and has an extensive background in comic book writing, partnered with Victor Cook, who would later go on to create the best version of Scooby-Doo in Mystery Incorporated. The two of them created The Spectacular Spider-Man, a show that premiered in 2008 with a who's who of voice actors like Gray Griffin, James Arnold Taylor, Clancy Brown, Phil Lamar, John DiMaggio, and Lacey Chabert. If you have no idea who these people are, I guarantee you have heard their voices in some animated show. The Spectacular Spider-Man ran for two seasons, finishing in 2009, and was about to begin production of its third season when Disney bought the rights to Marvel. That placed the show on a production hiatus. Now some of you are saying, but Spider-Man is owned by Sony. I know this because of the whole Spider-Man MCU debacle that comes up every few years when the studios want to rub each other's dicks with millions of dollars. And you'd be right. Not about the dick rubbing thing, but about Spider-Man being owned by Sony. Live action Spider-Man is owned by Sony. But the rights to make an animated Spider-Man were still owned by Marvel. The Spectacular Spider-Man was produced and distributed by Sony, meaning that when Disney bought the rights, Sony could no longer distribute and produce the show. And as the show was up to that point Sony's property, Disney was either incapable or unwilling to continue with the show, and instead gave us the absolute garbage fire of an animated Spider-Man with Ultimate Spider-Man. You're a terrible show and you should feel terrible! Six months later, it was announced, to no one's surprise, that The Spectacular Spider-Man had been cancelled. I found out on my 18th birthday that one of the best shows I had ever seen would never be finished. Such is the way of television, unfortunately. So why am I espousing the greatness of a show that was cancelled after two seasons and only 26 episodes? Because the show really understood where Spider-Man had come from and where Spider-Man needed to go, both historically and narratively. Weissman's long-standing relationship with comics meant he had a very deep understanding of what makes Spider-Man in particular special. The first reason is a broad explanation of the medium of television shows. When television first appeared in people's homes, film producers and production companies got scared. What will we do now that people can see picture shows right in the comfort of their own homes? I've got an idea. Let's give them something that those little screen networks can't even hope to accomplish. We already have bigger screens. Let's put it to good use by creating larger-than-life epics. Thus, we got the sword and sandal epics, like Ben-Hur and Cleopatra. All the spectacle and grandeur you can conjure up and plaster on a huge silver screen, thanks to expensive projectors, kept people going to the cinema. Television networks couldn't hope to keep up with this kind of budget that film companies were pumping into their productions. So they had to find another way. How are we going to get people interested in watching our programming with these shitty little screens? I'll tell you how we keep them coming back week after week, by getting them to relate to the characters and interested in the character drama. Although it is slowly starting to change, we still see the effects of this today. Superhero movies have huge budgets to create awesome spectacles, while the small screen has longer overall run times, allowing them to tell smaller contained stories and develop deeper and more complex relationships across a larger cast that interweave into a larger story. I prefer longer character-driven stories, but I can see the appeal of the spectacle, especially when it's done well. But I think that superhero stories lend themselves to the small screen more easily because the episodic nature of a show is similar to the monthly issue of a comic book. That is, a single contained story for one issue or one episode woven into a larger narrative. 
The 22 minute or 40 minute format allows for a bite size and manageable portion to be enjoyed with the option to continue or pause at any time. Plus, a good cliffhanger increases anticipation, and studies show that waiting in anticipation for the next episode actually increases enjoyment of television shows. I'm certain that Weissman and Cook knew this because they chose to take a lot of the events and stories straight from the comics, specifically drawing from the Amazing Spider-Man series. The biggest difference being that this version of Spider-Man is set in high school and stayed in high school. The first two seasons take place over the course of one semester at school, starting in September and finishing around the end of February. So a lot of the characters from the comics are reimagined so that they are in class with Peter Parker. The show also takes some liberties with some of the characters, choosing to make Liz Allen Hispanic. They create a son for Robbie Rand, and the drastically overhauled Sally Avril, who is now a more traditional mean girl and looks more like Liz Allen used to. On top of this, we also have the rogues gallery. All your favorites are back, like Green Goblin, Venom, and Dr. Octopus, as well as more obscure picks, but still fan favorites like the Chameleon, Black Cat, and my personal favorite, Electro. Side note, this is the best version of Electro ever, hands down, and Crispin Freeman does the voice superbly. I'm... what'd you call me? Lightning Bud? No, not that! Electro. Yeah. I'm Electro! The first thing that the narrative of Spectacular Spider-Man does right is to do away with the origin story. We all know that story. Anyone who has seen the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies or anyone familiar with pop culture in general knows how it all begins. Not to mention they just put a few choice scenes from that event in the opening song and we are left with this opportunity to dive right into the action. I'm also going to take this opportunity and say that it has an amazing opening theme, maybe even on par with the original Spider-Man jingle. <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Man. <laughs> Spider-Man. It's catchy. The first few episodes are basically just villain of the week episodes, but I think that this is fine because we need to get to know Peter and the characters that surround him and how they all interact. These plot lines are compressed versions of the events from the comics. The difference being that they take place in much more condensed time frames and are sometimes out of order from the original. This is all done with the intention of pushing the primary theme of the show, that Peter Parker needs to grow up and learn how to be Spider-Man. These are not the characters we know from the comics. They're younger versions, and the writer's goal was to show how these awkward high schoolers grew up to be the recognizable characters we all love. Every three to four episodes are grouped into loose arcs that are based off things that Peter's learning in school. From drama to biology, engineering, or chemistry, every episode plays with the theme of learning. It's a shame that the show was cancelled, but also not really surprising, and I'm not talking about the rights thing. The show is presented, as many animated shows are these days, as for children. The problem with this is that I am convinced that children would not be interested in the nuanced storytelling of this show in any way at all. Godspeed, fair Helena. Call you me fair? That fair again unsay. Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, teach me with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius' heart. Sure, they may be intrigued by the fact that it's Spider-Man and they get to watch him in cool action sequences, but the real story, the real fabric of the show is how to handle Peter Parker and Spider-Man, and young children probably won't pick up on that. This is something that I think no other superhero ever does right, and the thing that Spectacular Spider-Man does better than any other Spider-Man, and that is how to tell a story that is both about Peter and about Spider-Man. When you think about it, Spider-Man is kind of terrible. He has really silly superpowers. I mean, come on, a spider? Really? Spiders are neat, sure, but as a superpower based off of them, it's not really a stroke of genius. Well, maybe it's about the villains. Look at Batman, he's got some of the best villains of all time, and that makes for great storytelling. Watching how a superhero overcomes the obstacles that a villain represents can make for very dramatic and superb narratives. Spider-Man does have some truly great villains, but Spider-Man does something different and I think better than how Batman does it. Because how many Batman stories are actually about Bruce Wayne? That is the genius of the Spider-Man story. There is a balance between Spider-Man and Peter Parker and what they're both dealing with. And at a high school setting, this is even more brilliant. The huge cast of supporting characters with the villains, the people working at the Daily Bugle, and Peter's classmates are all there to balance out and demand Peter's time and energy. Peter as a character needs to feel morally obligated to do the right thing for everyone all the time, which is something no one can do. Every time Spider-Man defeats a villain or makes a daring save, Peter winds up flaking on a date or forgetting a school project. 
Characters are dynamic a lot of the time, and they have their own story arcs which we see play out around Peter and often affect him. This is both the classmates and the villains. Often the characters that Peter knows become the villains that Spider-Man faces off with, which brings another layer of complexity to how Peter and Spider-Man deal with fighting them or being friends with them. It is a very dynamic system of characters that Peter balances because ultimately Peter and Spidey are the same person. The mask and the name are not a change in his persona, they are used to protect the ones Peter loves. The new Tom Holland Spider-Man movies have done a lot to go back to basics and do all these things that I've been talking about that make Spider-Man great. But these movies have largely defined Spidey by his relationship to the MCU and to Tony Stark. And I think that overshadows a lot of the supporting characters that could be used to affect Peter Parker. With the universe at stake in these movies, the moral reasoning for why Peter is leaving his friends or how they're involved has to take a back seat because it's the fucking universe. This take is at least a different and new entertaining version of Spider-Man. And Homecoming and Into the Spider-Verse did more of this, but both of them focus on a larger scale story and a lot of setup towards larger stakes in that universe. But I think that New York is already a big enough place with a lot of responsibility for one little Spider-Man. My favorite example of this complex storytelling is in the episode Gangland. Spoilers because this episode takes place very late in the series, being the 10th episode of season 2, but it is quite possibly the best piece of western animation I have ever seen, and I couldn't pass up the opportunity to talk about it. It's Valentine's Day, and so all of Peter's classmates have gathered at a fancy restaurant. Peter is dumbstruck by how Gwen looks when she's dressed up, but he catches himself as he's dating Liz Allen, and Gwen has started seeing Harry. Meanwhile, J. Jonah Jameson has taken his wife to the opera, where unbeknownst to the audience, an illegal summit is also taking place. With Dr. Octopus, the Vulture, Silvermane, Silver Sable, Hammerhead, and Tombstone all in attendance. When the negotiations at the summit go sideways, the opera is interrupted, and Jonah wants Peter to take pictures, or he will be fired. Peter is forced to leave his friends and go take these pictures, and of course also be Spider-Man to defeat the enemies. Oh yeah, and most of the episode is scored by the songs from the opera Rigoletto, which is what was playing that night. Here Peter is dealing with his feelings for Gwen and Liz, as well as the other complexities of his social circle, such as Harry and Gwen maybe being together, and the fact that Liz is Flash Thompson's ex. When he leaves, it is under the pretense of taking pictures for the bugle, which he does actually do, but he makes a pointed effort to say goodbye to Gwen. This is of course something that Liz notices and is not happy about because Peter was her date. Peter arrives at the Met to find that Doc Ock, Tombstone, and Silvermane are all fighting while Hammerhead, Vulture, and Silver Sable are having a separate argument. Peter gets involved in both fights. This is a defining moment because Doc Ock has slowly established himself as the master planner. Silvermane is the old mobster style villain that used to run New York and has just gotten out of prison. And Tombstone has established himself as the primary antagonist of the show from the beginning. The show took its time introducing all of these villains separately and having Peter fight them separately. None of them was ever the singular villain of the whole story, often having them undercut and manipulate each other and sometimes work together. In the end, Spider-Man wins of course, but Peter Parker doesn't know the cost. He is slowly losing Liz Allen. He's incapable of telling Gwen how he feels due to his emotional immaturity and the fact that Liz is with Harry. To make matters worse, what he accomplished by defeating Tombstone, Silvermane, and Doc Ock was necessitating the need for the Vault, a prison created by Norman Osborn to keep supervillains locked up. Here's the real problem. You've created a power vacuum in the criminal universe, and nature abhors a vacuum. Which is easily filled by the Green Goblin who actually orchestrated the whole fight from the very beginning to get rid of the others. All of this was punctuated by some truly spectacular arias from Rigoletto. <laughs> Shows have used pre-composed music to accentuate the drama, or in this case, juxtapose it. But I really have to say that this episode is outstanding on all accounts. But that is because I'm a music nerd. Music aside, this episode may seem confusing with so much going on, but the ever-changing and growing roster of supporting characters makes for more engaging and varied circumstances for Peter to find himself in. And the way that those character arcs overlap speaks not only to great writing, but an understanding that Spider-Man and Peter Parker's stories must be the same, interwoven into each other in a way that is well-crafted, but appears to be messy. The same way that being both of these people in Peter's life is messy. 
And that is why this is the best version of Spider-Man ever. And if you don't believe me, go and check online and you can see that it's garnered critical acclaim from all over and even has 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. This show is known for being the best version of Spider-Man. And if you're still not convinced, just watch the freaking show. Here are some of the best parts of Spectacular Spider-Man. They perfectly nailed Spider-Man's quips and the humor throughout the whole show is spot on. We could rule New York! We talking Manhattan or all five? Nah. Sorry, I make it a rule not to partner with anyone green. Or, you know, psychotic. <laughs> oh well. Every character seems to have their own arc. Villains are often introduced two or three episodes before they even become villains, and sometimes even seasons before. Gwen and Peter's relationship feels natural as they slowly grow into each other, and I'm such a sucker for her makeover reveal, which hurts even more because they were building up to her death, which would have affected Peter and how he chooses to be Spider-Man, but also Mary Jane and how she was going to react to her friend dying, and why was this show cancelled? Hey, as always, thanks for watching this video. This episode took a little longer because my laptop broke halfway through and I had to get a new one. But uh, if you enjoyed that, feel free to subscribe and share so you can get more of This Is A Thing, or listen to our weekly podcast called Cinemaster's Ultimate Timeline.